Good morning, church. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. We have been gathered together, held by the Spirit. This is the season of Epiphany. Epiphany is a funny word. It means revelation. This is the season in the liturgical calendar in which the world more broadly begins to recognize just who Jesus is. And so we are here today to take in that light and to know we are loved and we are held by a gracious God. If you're visiting with us today, A warm welcome to you. There are some cards called Amos cards in the back of your pew. If you would be so kind as to fill that out if you'd like, we will make an attempt to uh, reach out and connect. And we hope you find today to be um, a rich and inspiring time in your life. We have some announcements. By the way, I'd like to share that Pastor Addie is out sick this morning. She's been struggling with uh, strep, so that's taken her out of commission. (laughs) It's that time of year. (laughs) There's a lot of sickness going around. So our prayers and thoughts are with Addie today. We have some announcements. I'd like to invite uh, Liz Rivett to come forward. Good morning. Uh, The Church Council of St. John's has called for a congregational meeting on Sunday, January 29th, following the 1015 worship services to be held in the sanctuary prior to the congregational dinner to be held in Assembly Hall. The agenda topics will include the election of new Church Council members, information about our visioning, search and call process for a new senior pastor, and planning for Pastor Addie's upcoming sabbatical. We encourage all members to attend this meeting to participate in this important work of our St. John's community and faith. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Dan Patachida has something that he would like to share. Well, I'm the third one to say good morning. I hope that some of you on your way in was able to see this poster or flyer uh, about an art show that's taking place over at the Eclipse Gallery. Now, if you don't know where that is, it's on Vine Street. It's a little brick building that faces the parking lot of Uh, the Lansdale Post Office. Now I had planned on saying certain things this morning, but then when I came in and put down my invitation, I saw the cover of this and saw, ah, the great invitation. And it also says, see, show, and share, which basically I'd like to do. I also looked at the opening prayer, the call to worship, and it talks about darkness and light. And one thing I'd like, it's very serendipitous. Uh, I tend to feel that there's a, a large hand moving me in a direction because the owner of the Eclipse Gallery, when asked why she chose that name, she said this, and I quote, Eclipse was named for the unexpected moments of darkness we all face and the light on the other side. I couldn't find a better comparison to our opening prayer. Uh, Again, I would like to invite you to the show 
Uh, it's not 10 or 15 pieces of art. It's going to be about 45 paintings that I've done over the last few years. And uh, I hope that if you can't make the opening, uh, the show runs from February 3rd to March 10th, and you might have an opportunity to come over and take a look at what I've been doing. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Bill and Judy Leslie would like to thank everyone here who helped undecorate the sanctuary. Um, this past week, we've moved out of the Christmas season and into Epiphany. So um, many thanks to those who spent time undecorating. There is also, um, there are some sign-up sheets in the narthex and by the elevator lobby regarding this congregational dinner that's scheduled for the 29th of January. So if you, if you know you're going to come to the dinner, which we would hope you would, we want you to sign up. I think folks are just trying to get a number. And let us know on that sign-up sheet whether or, or not that you're bringing a dessert. I think that does it for announcements. So when we come to worship, we know that God engages us just as we are. And so I invite you now into this time when we open ourselves to the God who reaches in, who touches us, who loves us, and who knows us just as we are.
God, here we are, gathered in to worship, to pray, to listen for your voice. We are still basking in the light of this new season, in the light of this new day. We recall days of darkness, times when we were at rock bottom in the muddy pits of despair. You assure us that we wait patiently for you. You hear our cries. You set our feet upon a rock, and you send the light of your Son, Jesus, to shine upon us. There is before each and all of us a great invitation to see the light, and to be the light that guides the way for wholeness, truth, love, justice, and peace. May that same light guide us into worship this day, and may we know and trust that you meet us here. Would you join with me as together we confess our sins? Loving God, Epiphany is a season of invitation into the light as we discover more about who this Christ child is and who he will become. We confess that since we have heard all the stories before, it is easy for us to listen passively and set aside the invitation to enter even further into the mystery and grow even deeper in our love and discipleship. Remind us, God, that choosing to follow and engage is a practice and a commitment to continuing to respond daily to Christ's invitation and call. May we have eyes to see the light in our midst, lives that show just how much Jesus matters, and hearts that share with others the good news of God's love. Amen. Yes, Jesus has invited us into an abundant life, a rich life, a full life, a life of joy. And part of that abundant life is recognizing our shortcomings, our failures, our sins, and know that we're forgiven that we are given a fresh start, a new day, and a new life. And so we thank God for the grace that has been showered upon us. You are forgiven. You are loved. God is good. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading is Psalm 40, 1 through 11. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, there would be more than could be counted. Sacrifice an offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. 
burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the chosen one. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, which looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Okay, I'd like to invite the children to come forward, and I would also like to invite Mr. Hales to come on down. It turns out, come on, hey, good morning, good morning. You can have a seat. It turns out that Mr. Hales knows something about sheep. So... We're going we're gonna to turn it over to Ken, and um, thank you. I was raised on a farm not far from here in Montgomery Township. Now, back in the day, there were a lot of farms in this area, but not so much anymore. And on our farm, we had, we had lots of sheep. We had a horse, we had chickens, um, we had a goat that was absolutely incorrigible. He got into all kinds of trouble. But this morning, I want to tell you about sheep. Now, sheep are very docile animals. They're very easily pleased, um, and they're sort of defenseless. If a skunk is attacked, it can spray its enemy. Other animals have teeth and so forth, and they can can fight off their prey, but not sheep. They're sort of defenseless, and so they need a shepherd. I brought a picture, and this picture is of me in front of the barn, and I think I was about five years old. Can you tell the congregation what I'm doing? Feeding the goat. Feeding the goat. I am giving the baby lamb, yes, a bottle of milk. 
Now that seems really strange to bottle feed a lamb, but that's what we had to do sometimes. Um, sometimes the mother sheep would have one and two babies, but other times they would have like four, maybe even more, and they couldn't feed all of the lambs. So my sister's job and my job was to bottle feed the lambs that weren't getting enough nutrition. And guess what? As a result of that, the lambs thought we were their mother. <laughs> and for the rest of the life of that sheep, they would follow us all around the fields. If we would go out into the pasture, the rest of the sheep could care less. Uh, but the ones that we bottle fed, they were our buddies forever. Um, they would come up and they would butt against our legs, give me a bottle of milk, and uh, it was quite an experience. Now I have one more story I can tell you about sheep. Um, often when a sheep uh, does something, the rest of the flock follow right along and do whatever he, he wants them to do. So one Sunday, we were coming home from church. And lo and behold, to our horror, we saw our whole flock of sheep out of our field on the other side of the road at our neighbors. So, I mean, this, that was bad enough, but our neighbor was a florist. He had five or six greenhouses, and the sheep thought they had gone to heaven. <laughs> so back in the day, you dressed up when you went to church. We got out of the car, all dressed up, and herded all the sheep back onto our side of the road <laughs> where they belonged. Sheep need a shepherd. Ken, thank you. That, that's amazing. Oh. Well, why don't you stand up and we're going to want to thank Mr. Hales. And as we do each Sunday at this time, we say the Lord's Prayer. So let us all join together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hales.
we all have various responsibilities and commitments in life. Some of those responsibilities and commitments take the form of a a calling. You might consider your job as an accountant or, or a caretaker or a groundskeeper, something that brings you joy, serves the world around you, and employs your gifts and skills. You might consider that a calling, whereas someone else might consider that same work just a job. You might consider raising or caring for your family a calling, while someone else might consider it just a part of life. There is something about the human spirit that seeks to contribute to something larger than themselves. Some find volunteering gives them a deep sense of satisfaction and purpose. Others pursue a hobby or art or something else in which they can express themselves, and they want to share that with the larger world. Dan Panachata is a perfect example of that. People sometimes refer to the activities or work they do as vocation, which comes from the Latin word calling, or more accurately, summons. For people of faith, there is often a sense in which God is calling them to a profession or a certain kind of work or to make a certain kind of contribution. And there are also times when we don't really have a sense of what that special thing we are called to do looks like. We may need a change, sense a change in us, wanting to do something, looking for something more, but we don't know quite what it is. Quaker author and teacher Parker Palmer wrestled with this idea of calling or vocation. And he writes about his own life and his quest for vocation. He suggests that vocation is not an act of will, not a sheer determination to do this thing or that thing. What Parker Palmer discovered is that, and I want to quote here, vocation does not come from willfulness. It comes from listening. Vocation does not mean a goal I pursue. It means a calling that I hear. Before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I must listen to my life telling me who I am. There is something about John the Baptist's disciple Andrew which suggests to me that he was looking for some deeper sense of purpose or a calling, something in his life was needed. Andrew was one of two people with John the Baptist when John announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In this instance, within John's Gospel, the word sin 
is not so much referring to individual failures. It's more of a state of the world's brokenness. And if anyone could identify with the world's brokenness, it was John the Baptist and Andrew. You see, the world was very broken for Jews living in that era. It was full of Roman oppression. John the Baptist declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God, the one who would bring liberation, the one who would break the dominion of oppression, the one that would strip away that gripping power of sin. And it would be nothing short of deliverance. Of course, that breaking the dominion of oppression Brokenness and sin would not come through military might or coercion, as so many thought. No, instead, it came through the power of love. Christ's death on a cross. Jesus asks the ultimate question to Andrew and to the other named, unnamed person who was one of John's disciples. He asks them, what are you looking for? As persons of faith, I'd like to ask you, what are you looking for from Jesus? Are you looking for wealth? Are you looking for status? Are you looking for security? Are you looking for guidance? Are you looking for healing? Are you looking for a way to make a difference? Jesus ended up inviting Andrew and the other disciple to come and see. Maybe Jesus showed them what the path of liberating the world from sin and oppression looks like. Maybe Jesus may have helped them make a connection to their own yearnings and aspirations for the world. His invitation, come and see, was an invitation to go deeper. Maybe all this does have something to do with vocation, our calling, our purpose, something to do with why we are here on earth. After all, Jesus' baptism, whom John the Baptist witnessed, was a revelation of who Jesus was and furthermore a revelation of his purpose his holy vocation. Maybe along with Andrew and Peter, those first followers of Jesus, we are all being summoned. What are we looking for? And what do you seek in your desire to follow Jesus? Something within us suspects that our work, our faith, our vocation should be rooted in the way Christ has spoken to us and allowed our true selves to shine forth. The great civil rights architect Howard Thurman referred to this endeavor of finding our true selves as listening to the call of the genuine. Thurman was an African-American pastor, theologian, educator, civil rights leader who died in 1981. His writings and his life influenced several civil rights leaders, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
Thurman was a sage. He was wise. He was a teacher and mentor. In 1980, Howard Thurman gave an address at Spelman College in Atlanta, where he once taught philosophy and religion years earlier, and his address was titled, The Sound of the Genuine. This is in part what Thurman said. I quote, There is in you something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And sometimes there is so much traffic going on in your minds, so many different kinds of signals, so many vast impulses floating through your organism that go back thousands of generations long before you were even a thought in the mind of creation. And you are buffeted by these. And in the midst of all this, you have to find out what your name is. Who are you? He concludes this section of the speech by asking, what does the sound of the genuine Come through you. Thurman had an incredible impact on Dr. Martin Luther King, whose birthday is today, whose birthday we celebrate nationally tomorrow. Dr. King heard the sound of the genuine. Dr. King was summoned, called, and he responded to that invitation that Jesus made to him in the same way that Jesus invited Andrew and this other disciple, saying, come and see. Martin Luther King Jr. was invited to come and see just as you and I have been summoned, invited, called, come and see. We have all been called to go deeper, to see what Jesus sees in us, to respond to the sound of the genuine, to see, show, and share the love of God in action. My brothers, sisters, and siblings, this is good news. Amen.
As we enter a time of joys and concerns, I'd like to lift up the following. Concern for Gerald and Mary Ellen Snyder on the passing of their son, Jim, which was on Saturday. And two joys, birthday wishes to Jerry Linderman and a joy from Kathleen Sedell, an excellent one-year follow-up regarding her spinal surgery and hopes to see improvement in the year to come. With these in mind, please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that Jesus' call to his disciples came in such an uneventful way, that Jesus did not start with the privileged and the wealthy and the powerful. He did not begin with those who had little need and little desire for change. He began with very simple folk, people just like us, ordinary people who were devoted to their work, who experienced joy and pain, worry, fear, and excitement. It was them who God chose to call. We pray that Christ's call, come and see, may call us, and may again verberate through our souls this day. May we hear again the challenge to be your disciples. May we hear again the invitation from the one who hears our cry, who draws us up from darkness and sets our feet upon a solid rock. May we hear again with fresh ears words of hope, which tell us that however dark the world becomes, however bad the news seems, nothing can compare to the light that you radiate. May we hear again the simple words, come and see. And may we do just that. May we go just as we are, knowing again the depth of your love for us. We pray for those whose health is a constant and major concern, for those who are experiencing grief, loss, hopelessness, fear, or worry. We pray especially for Gerald and Mary Ellen Snyder on the passing of their son, Jim. We also celebrate today with those feeling joy of any and many kinds. We thank you for new and renewed life among us, for places of hope and healing, for smiles and laughter and friendship shared in this place. We especially today think of Kathleen and Jerry. God, give us the courage to stop what we are doing and pay attention to the call you have for us. May we walk alongside you. May we invite others along. And may we feel you beside us this day and all the days of our lives. All of these things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Yes, we have been called, we have been summoned, we have been blessed. And so we give our tithes, gifts, and offerings. And so we receive them now.
Gracious God, we are your sheep, and we have been called to join you in the work of reconciling the world, the work of bringing healing, the work of bringing hope. Bless these gifts and bless our lives as we continue to follow you, Christ, our Holy Shepherd. Amen. Yes, you have been called. You have been called to listen to your life, to listen for the ways in which God is speaking to you. So open yourselves and listen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.